What should we make of the book of Judith? Hello everyone. As a lifelong Protestant, I have had very little actually precisely zero knowledge of the books of what we Protestants call the Apocrypha. And only a few years ago that I read uh, for the first time any of those books. But lately I was reading one of the books in the Apocrypha, Book of Judith, and I wasn't sure what to make of it. Uh, this is the first time I've experienced this book this year. The Book of Judith does not show up in the lectionary in the 1928 American Prayer Book, which is what I had been using, but it does show up in the lectionary for the 1662 Prayer Book as restored in the uh, IVP International Edition. So for the first time um, recently, I read through the book of Judith in its entirety. And for those of you familiar with it, I apologize. I'm going to give a extremely brief rundown of the story, um, cutting out huge important parts, I'm sure. But uh, for those of you who are unfamiliar, maybe this will be useful. Uh, I'm going to read here from the Jerusalem Bible. Just a couple of quick sections and give you the uh, basic plot details as quick as I can. So it begins, it was the 12th year of Nebuchadnezzar who reigned over the Assyrians in the great city of Nineveh. Arphaxad was then reigning over the Medes at Ecbatana. He surrounded this city with walls of dressed stones, three cubits thick and six cubits long, etc., etc. So Nebuchadnezzar, according to this story, Judith, reigned over the Assyrians in the great city of Nineveh. We'll come back to that in a moment. Basic plot here, Nebuchadnezzar decides to uh, go to war against this Arphaxad of the Medes, uh, calls on all of the uh, neighboring kings and city-states uh, all the way down into Egypt and through Canaan, uh, asking all of their leaders to send armies to assist him in the taking of this um, Arphaxad. And um, none of them showed up. Uh, however, uh, Nebuchadnezzar's armies were ultimately successful in uh, destroying and conquering um, the Medes. And uh, as repayment for the lack of support from all of these other city-states, including the uh, area inhabited by uh, the tribes of Israel, Nebuchadnezzar decided to send his um, top general to lay waste to all of these city-states. So the armies of uh, Nebuchadnezzar, under the leadership of Holofernes, the uh, general, um, marched out against all of these uh, places to uh, to lay waste to them, but so all of the peoples of these city states against which Holofernes was marching either uh, gave up and and ran and retreated and abandoned their cities or uh, surrendered immediately, except for the Israelites. And uh, this story takes place in a named place called Bethulia <clears throat> that, uh, as far as I know, does not show up anywhere else in scripture or in any other ancient writings, but the, uh, but it's in the area of Samaria, from what I understand, uh, based on the description here. And the um, Israelites of this city decided to make a stand against the armies of Nebuchadnezzar led by Holofernes and um, wait out the siege. And so they um, laid in provisions and uh, awaited the arrival of the army. Um, 
Holofernes camped uh, some distance. I guess uh, Bethulia is up in kind of in a hilly region, um, but Holofernes ordered the water supply cut out, uh, filled in with stones, blockaded, so that people in Bethulia would uh, thirst to death or, or be weakened with starvation and, and thirst and uh, therefore surrender. Now the leaders, the elders of the uh, Jews in that city uh, began to despair and were at the point of giving up, surrendering, uh, even though that would likely mean their almost certain death uh, by the sword. Um, we meet this character by the name of Judith, and she's introduced in chapter 8. We learn a little bit about her heritage here at the beginning of chapter 8, her uh, ancestors. Uh, but it says, as a widow, Judith stayed inside her home for three years and four months. She had an upper room built for herself on the roof. She wore sackcloth around her waist and dressed in widow's weeds. She fasted every day of her widowhood, except for the Sabbath Eve, the Sabbath itself, the Eve of New Moon, etc., etc. Now she was very beautiful, charming to see. Her husband Manasseh had left her gold and silver, manservants and maidservants, cattle and lands, and she lived among all her possessions without anyone finding a word to say against her. So devoutly did she fear God. So we have this widow who is wealthy and beautiful and upright in uh, impeccable moral standing, um, apparently well loved and respected among the Jews of her uh, city, Bethulia. And uh, she is enraged that the leaders are talking of surrendering to the armies of Holofernes. And she goes to them and um, has a bit to say here. Listen to me, leaders of the people of Bethulia. You were wrong to speak to the peoples as you did today and to bind yourself by oath and defiance of God to surrender the town to our enemies. Who are you to put God to the test today, you out of all mankind, to set yourselves above him, etc. So she devises a plan, apparently, um, by which she intends to help to deliver the Jews of this town, of this city, from the hand of Holofernes. And uh, before beginning her plan, she raises this prayer to God, and she... Uh, As a descendant of Simeon, uh, goes over some of the things that uh, took place that uh, readers of the Old Testament would be familiar with. Um, and then she gets down to business here. God, my God, now hear this widow too, for you have made the past, what is happening now and what will follow, what is, what will be, you have planned, what has been, you designed, your purposes stood forward, et cetera, et cetera. See the Assyrians boasting in their array glorying in their horses and their riders, exulting in the strength of their infantry. Trust as they may in shield and spear and bow and sling. In you they have not recognized the Lord, the shatterer of war, yours alone the title of Lord. Break their violence with your might. In your anger bring down their strength, for they plan to profane your holy places, to defile the tabernacle, the resting place of your glorious name, and to throw down with iron the horn of your altar. Observe their arrogance, send your fury on their heads, give the needful courage to this widow's hand. By guile of my lips, strike slave down with master and master with his servant, break their pride by a woman's hand. Skipping down a bit, please, please God of my father, God of the heritage of Israel, master of heaven and earth, creator of the waters, king of your whole creation, hear my prayer. Give me a beguiling tongue to wound and kill those who have formed such cruel designs against your covenant, against your holy dwelling place, against Mount Zion, against the house belonging to your sons, and demonstrate to every nation, every tribe, that you are Yahweh, God Almighty, all-powerful. So she goes with her servant into the camp of Holofernes, and um, basically offers some um, words of advice 
to Holofernes and he takes her into his tent and um, feeds her and keeps her well and promises uh, that she will receive uh, good treatment. Courage, woman, Holofernes said, do not be afraid. I have never heard anyone who chose to serve Nebuchadnezzar, king of the whole world. So she stays there for a few days. And uh, at one point, Holofernes, um, thinking he will be mocked for having such a um, beautiful woman in his tent without having, as it were, made any progress with her, let us say, um, has a feast uh, at which she is in attendance and he becomes very drunk with wine. She then takes his sword and removes his head and with her servant carries it back to Bethulia and shows it to the leaders of the Jews there in that city. When she shows the head of Holofernes, uh, we pick up the story here in uh, towards the end of chapter 13, overcome with emotion, the people all fell on their knees and worshiped God, exclaiming as one man, blessings on you, O our God, for confounding your people's enemies today. Uzziah then said to Judith, may you be blessed, my daughter, by God most high, beyond all women on earth, and may the Lord God be blessed the creator of heaven and earth, by whose guidance you cut off the head of the leader of our enemies. The trust you have shown shall not pass from the memories of men, but shall ever remind them of the power of God. God grant you to be always held in honor and rewarded with blessings, since you did not consider your own life when our nation was brought to its knees, but warded off our ruin, walking undeterred before our God. More praising of Judith here. May you be blessed in all the tents of Judah and in every nation. At the sound of your name, men will be seized with dread. Uh, the high priest here praising God and uh, particularly, especially Judith. You are the glory of Jerusalem. You are the great pride of Israel. You are the highest honor of our race. By doing all this with your own hand, you have deserved well of Israel. And God has approved what you have done. May you be blessed by the Lord Almighty in all the days to come. And then here we have Judith herself um, inspired to uh, sing a song of praise, apparently to herself and to God. Praise my God with the tambourine. Sing to the Lord with a cymbal. Let psalm and canticle mingle for him. Extol his name, invoke it. For the Lord is a God who shatters war. He has pitched his camp in the middle of his people to deliver me from the hands of my enemies. Assyria came down from the mountains of the north, came with tens of thousands of his army, etc., etc. But the Lord Almighty has thwarted them by a woman's hand, for their hero did not fall at the young men's hands. It was not sons of titans who struck him down. No proud giants made that attack, but Judith, the daughter of Merari, who disarmed him with the beauty of her face, she laid aside her widow's dress to rally those who were oppressed in Israel. She anointed her face with perfume, bound her hair under a turban, put on a linen gown to seduce him. Her sandal ravished his eye. Her beauty took his soul prisoner, and the scimitar cut through his neck, etc., etc. Woe to the nations who rise against my race. The Lord Almighty will punish them on judgment day. He will send fire and worms in their flesh and they shall weep with pain forevermore. So a couple things about the story. It's a terrific story of deliverance, um, but there are some issues with it. First of all, there are historical issues. Um, at the very beginning was the 12th year of Nebuchadnezzar who reigned over the Assyrians. Um, we learned from other parts of scripture and from history that Nebuchadnezzar was uh, the Babylonian king, not the Assyrian king, and ruled in the great city of Nineveh. No, by this time, by the time of Nebuchadnezzar, Nineveh was um, raised to the ground or no longer a, the capital of, uh, certainly not the capital of, of uh, Babylon or Assyria. So a couple of um, problems there. Now, why would it be written 
this way to people who would certainly know the difference. Uh, even I, you know, from, again, from other scripture, know that Nebuchadnezzar uh, was a Babylonian king. Also at the very end, I kind of skipped over kind of the epilogue, as it were. Never again during the lifetime of Judith, nor indeed for long after her death, did anyone trouble the sons of Israel. So according to this story, Judith uh, comes up with this plan, um, uses some treachery to uh, betray and then slaughter the general of the uh, Assyrians or Babylonians, however you want to read that. And then um, apparently thwarts their plan at conquering the Jews. But again, we know from other parts of scripture that that was not in fact the case. And in fact, the um, Babylonian captivity is a major theme in much of the, the Old Testament. So Nebuchadnezzar did indeed rule the area that this supposedly takes place in. So they didn't live happily ever after. They went into exile. So I'm, I'm not sure what what to make of Judith. If it's uh, just a, a neat story, almost a historical fiction, I hate to say that. Don't, don't say nasty things about me in the comments, but I'm not, I'm not sure what to make of it. Now, are they describing maybe some other event and just kind of changing the, uh, the names of the characters and the time it took place? I don't know. I don't know what the point of that would be. Um, is it just a morality tale that they are wrapping in the trappings of a quasi-historical event? Uh, maybe, but what would be the moral? Because the way that Judith behaves in this story seems to be somewhat at odds with other Old Testament heroes of the Jews. When one thinks of Gideon, who... Uh, didn't devise a plan to, um, you know, be victorious in war, but he was uh, given plans by God that seemed counterintuitive and ridiculous, but ultimately were successful. Um, Joshua at Jericho, same same story. Uh, he didn't come up with a plan and act on his own and sing his own praises, um, but followed what seemed to be ridiculous orders of God and... Um, against all odds, they were successful. So nowhere in here prior to Judith taking action against Holofernes, uh, does it say that God spoke to her and, and told her to take this action? It, it seems that she has devised this plan on her own and then um, writes a hymn of praise to herself afterwards. Um, so very unusual story. Um, but it, it seems to have echoes in the New Testament, um, kind of a flip side of the coin in the story of the Annunciation, the Magnificat uh, with Mary, um, who also has a song of praise, but a, a very, very different song of praise. So we have the Annunciation at the beginning of Luke here. Um, Mary is told of the plan that God has for her, told by an angel and her response let what you have said be done to me. And the angel left her, and later we hear the familiar song of Mary. My soul proclaims the greatness of the Lord, and my spirit exalts in God my Savior, because he has looked upon his lowly handmaid. Yes, from this day forward, all generations will call me blessed, for the Almighty has done great things for me. Holy is his name, and his mercy reaches from age to age for those who fear him. He has shown the power of his arm. He has routed the proud of heart. He has pulled down princes from their thrones and exalted the lowly. The hungry he has filled with good things. The rich he sent empty away. He has come to the help of Israel, his servant, mindful of his mercy. According to the promise he made to our ancestors of his mercy to Abraham and to his descendants forever. <clears throat> so, exalted the lowly. Mary is uh, describing herself here. He looked upon his lowly handmaid. He has exalted the lowly. The hungry he has filled with good things. Um, talking about herself in these very humble terms while 
on the flip side, Judith is described as somebody wealthy and beautiful and high in status, um, certainly morally upright or in the eyes of the law, um, unimpeachable. Um, devises her own plan, is the savior of Israel, is the um, hymns are made to her praise, while Mary, lowly, the handmaid, the humble, um, we all know the Magnificat. That's something um, sung and celebrated uh, by Christians um, everywhere for all time. Um, the story of Judith, I, I don't know what to make of it. Uh, so if, if it's something you're more familiar with, it can tell me how I should be reading that story uh, because I'm, I'm a bit confused. It doesn't, it's not apparently historically accurate and apparently wasn't intended to be. And as a morality tale, it uh, seems to sit askew from uh, the moral lessons we learn in the Old Testament or the New. So just wanted to kind of compare those two things, the Song of Judith versus the Song of Mary, and um, ask for some help from you all if you know how I ought to take the Book of Judith. Uh, let me know. I'd like to hear it. Um, certainly uh, give me your thoughts in the comments. I always appreciate you watching and joining the conversation. Thanks for watching with me today and uh, hope to see you here again next time.